Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. We're welcoming you all today to the Infomar webinar. Uh, it's the second in a series uh, that we've been running um, uh, on behalf of Geological Survey Ireland and Marine Institute. Uh, today is uh, a quick update. Uh, we haven't been able to, due to the challenges of the, the last two years, to, to proceed and, and, and do this live or have our usual annual seminar. So we're doing a digital event to, to give you a quick catch up on, on what's been happening over the, the year gone by. So um, the topics we're going to touch on today are the 2021 programme updates. Uh, we will uh, give you some updates on the National Seabed Mapping Capacity Build activity that's been going on behind the scenes. Uh, and uh, we're going to start to look to the scientific monitoring uh, aspects of what we do to support resource and change management. Uh, and that's really looking at how our data can support um, various different initiatives and challenges that we face. Uh, I would encourage people to put comments in the chat during the session. Uh, there is a chat button on your, on your screen that will allow you to, to input. Uh, I am not going to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to um, uh, hand you over to, uh, to, to Owen at this point who is going to give a quick intro on behalf of GSI. Sorry, we're having some technical glitches at the start here. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, it wouldn't be a proper webinar with a few, a few glitches to get over at the start. Um, so yeah, uh, you're all very welcome to this webinar. This is uh, Owen here at the Marine and Coastal Unit over in GSI. I'm standing in for uh, Sean Cullen, who's been called away on other business, uh, so he couldn't make it today. As Tommy said, this is our second webinar in the Infomar series. Um, our first one was last March, and it was focused on offshore renewable energy. Um, and it was very successful. It, it was a really nice format, the way the whole thing worked out. So we're very happy to be running the second one. In that first um, webinar, we had a few interesting talks from industry representatives and some really nice uh, discussions um, around how Infomar data can support the offshore wind sector and also how that sector can feed back into the national mapping program. So in the end, we got some really good feedback from that webinar, and we hope to, hope to get the same from this one which as Tommy said, is focused on mapping and monitoring for environmental applications. Um, one thing I'd like to draw your attention to is we are running an interactive poll, uh, which we encourage attendees to take part in. It's another source of very useful feedback for us. And the, the theme or the question that the poll was based around is, what should Infomar focus on after completion of baseline mapping to best support future scientific mo uh, monitoring of Ireland's marine environment? And there are three, uh, uh, answers you can choose from. There's creating a seamless map from land to sea, otherwise known as mapping the, the white ribbon, as we've always called it, that area of no data that we have just very close to the coast, um, along with a, a wider range of uh, value-added product. Number two is developing a resurvey program. So that's going out and actually remapping areas of seabed to support modeling, monitoring, change management, among other, uh, other activities. Um, and number three, is more about outreach and communication. It's enhanced communication of Infomar's baseline assets. So it's getting the word out there in, in an even stronger way about our existing data sets, our existing products, the range of advice the team can offer on technical matters and policy matters. And then not to mention the actual physical infra infrastructure that Infomar has built up. So that's vessels and equipment. And the, the results of that poll will actually provide us with very useful feedback as we look to drafting a strategy for 2023 and beyond. So as, as Tommy said, definitely encourage people to ask questions in text form in the little uh, Q&A box there. We do have a member of the Infomar team on standby who do their best, do their best to answer those questions in close to real time. And uh, anything that can't be answered now will be followed up on offline after the webinar. So uh, with that, I'd like to open the first session which is a presentation by Aileen Bohan from the GSI on uh, Infomar's uh, seabed mapping operations this year, followed by a talk then from, from Tommy from the MI on data research and innovation activity. Hello and welcome to the Infomar webinar. My name is Aileen Bohan and I'll be giving a quick update on the operational updates from 2021. It's going to be a quick update and quite brief, so feel free to reach out for more information. So just to, to give a quick overview, um, I'm going to begin with talking about the original operations plan. I'll then move on to the Marine Institute coverage updates before looking at the geological survey coverage updates. And of course, this is all going to include lots of lovely bathymetric images and scenic photographs. 
the GSI update is going to follow the timeline of the survey season. We're going to begin in Cork and move our work way around the coast before returning to Dublin Bay for the winter. So to begin with the 2021 operations plan, as we know, Infomar's partnership of the Marine Institute and the Geological Survey. In terms of mapping, the Marine Institute works outside the 30 nautical miles boundaries so around here. These yellow and orange blocks are the Marine Institute's areas, whereas the Geological Survey works within the 30 nautical miles boundaries, so all these purple areas, and right up until zero LAT. So you can see the green star, and these are all the vessels that are make up our, our fleet this, this summer. The green stars show the various ports that we were working in. So in Cork, Baltimore, Castletown Bear, Dingle, and Rossabeel. So we're going to begin with the Marine Institute updates. And this is data collected by the Explorer and the Celtic Voyager, from all from beyond the 30 nautical mile boundary. They totaled 90 days of sea time and managed to achieve their target, acquiring over 6,100 kilometers squared of new data. It's quite exciting. You can see all the lovely blocks there. And also see hints of the glacial moraines and some of the exciting features that are coming out. These fields of sand waves. And they're also collecting chirp data and water column data as they're out there. And then to go on to the geological survey updates, but staying in the Celtic Sea, we'll go to Castletown Bear, you can see the lovely board there, and Baltimore, where so the Curie and the Mallet will, on the Kitchen of the Lear, we're working out here collecting data. And, and we're finally able to finish the block this summer. So that was quite exciting because it was been quite a difficult area for us to work in. And it's quite a, it can be a flat boring seabed in places. But there was lovely, exciting bits of ro lovely rocky parts and also a few shipwrecks out there. Not all multi beam mapping happening. We also did a bit of current profiling around the Serviliant in inner boundary bay there. And um, you can see that's the multi beam image of the Serviliant. You can see the cannons on her deck. Um, and this was using Cherished ADCP. So we mounted it on the mallet. You can see it on this pole mount. We headed out early one morning and we began to collect data all through a high and low tide cycle. And all of this was done with the aim of better understanding some of the kind of current regimes and the strengths around the Serbian or that are acting upon it. Meanwhile, the small oils were busy in Kenmare Bay. This image shows the a, a merged image of all the data collected both by the Green Institute and all the areas where we've pushed in this summer by the Geological Survey. So you can see it makes quite an impressive bit of petrometry. This uh, color scale is going from zero LAT down to the purple is 30 meters LAT, or greater than 30 meters LAT. So this contains lots of tricky areas, especially with all these fish farms, especially here in uh, a hard groom. And there's some beautiful geology out here, though, especially um, these paleo channels and kind of folded rocky outcrop out by Derry Nan. Lots of jellyfish out there. We made it even as far as Kenmare Bridge. So we didn't go far the bridge, as far as the, beyond the bridge. So I guess we'll leave that for uh, Infomar too. Another exciting highlight of this was um, Bull Rock. So down in the southwest of Ireland, Lear began taking advantage of the conditions and mapped right through um, the Bull Rock, the tunnel you can see there. So they found it was about this channel here, which you can see in the Chimera window. It's about 14 meters deep, makes a lovely V shape. And it's going to make a very fun uh, flight through animation. It'll also be interesting to see how to, how to depict the data on top of the land, which is a bit confusing. Well, the ribs busy in Kenmare Bay, the Kiri, um, went over to Stingle Bay. She's then joined by the Lear. This is, again, a merged map of the data from the Marine Institute and the Geological Survey. So it goes from zero meters to greater than 50 meters. So we were based out of Dingo Bay, you can see here, and we were um, just tied up in the marina beside the funfair. We were working away all around the Blasket Islands and Valencia. It was a really beautiful landscape. You can see all the Port McGee channels filled in, all the, up on, on the cliffs around along here. And it was really amazing to get to see all the islands up close. There's lots of puffins and seals and even deer on Inishvik along. One of my favourite and most westerly point of Ireland is Inish Chirach. You can see there the lighthouse. I think it stands at like 85 metres. And it was really great to see all the geology of Dingle up close. You can see the layers of old red sandstone and lots of desiccation cracks from when Ireland was a good bit drier. And there was also a remapping of the SS Manchester Merchant. And Cherise produced this um, amazing looking image of the shipwreck using cloud compare. You can see the three boilers there. 
which is quite impressive. But then we also made a high, high resolution map of the skeleton. You can see all the structure there. Um, and these are the preliminary results. So it's quite an exciting survey season. When we then, with Smirk Harbour complete, we had named to move uh, further to the northeast, but unfortunately, Phoenix was full. So we leapfrogged Phoenix and went on up to Connemara to Rossiville, um, another beautiful part of the world. These maps show the areas that the boats were working on over the summer. So you can see as it was divided up by the boats. Obviously, these were roughly divided up depending on weather and conditions, etc. As you can see, there's still a lot to do. So we will be going back there next year. So lots of uh, tricky little in short parts, and lots of hydrographic notes were generated, of course. To zoom in on some of the interesting areas, especially around the scared rocks, you can see the features there. You can even pick out the Carboniferous Limestone and go away granite contact, which is quite impressive. We didn't think we'd be able to see that in the multi beam. So again, in Ishmore, you can see all the lovely limestone layers. And if you zoom in on Dune Angus, you can see the individual boulders. And um, particularly if, if you've ever paid attention or seen some of Rona Cox's research, see the excitement that we have in trying to monitor all these uh, boulders by repeat surveys. But it's not all mapping. We also carried out some exercises with the Irish Coast Guard. This is an uh, exercise with the Coast Guard near the Scared Rocks in the Orvi Kiri. Is the captain August uh, doing the high line and getting the Irish Coast Guard person on board? As well as, uh, not quite, a, it was actually more of a cherished project, but um, so this was actually, this isn't actually Infamar, this is cherished, but um, still on the URV Curie. So in September, we went around for two weeks to uh, Wales to do a bit of mapping and sampling. So we spent one week in Pukeli here, and then the next week in Carnarfon and Manai Bridge. So we started off in Pukeli, we did a bit of mapping and sampling around Sarn Patrick. So we, this has been mapped in previous years, and we extended on the coverage in the southeast on this delta. And it was quite impressive. We um, resolved, you can see another boulder field completely resolved all these delta uh, sediments. We also a uh, charted shipwreck. You can see that's just opened up, and that's pretty incredible to see. We're also collecting samples and around Bardsey Island and around um, Bear Grills Island for seeing totals. So then we moved up to the north and we did a bit of work around Ross Niger, Dennis Dula, Puffin Island, and Dulles Island. This shows the bathymetry of Puffin Island, and you can see our sample sites there and marked in. These were chosen after analyzing the bathymetric data. Altogether, we collected 66 samples, so it was quite a success. We also um, managed to get the Voyager for a few days in between legs to try and tackle some of our offshore areas to the west. Unfortunately, the weather didn't allow for this, so we went to the south. But still, we acquired a good bit of data in 56 hours of um, mapping at quite short notice. Um, myself and our grad student, Kieran, we went out for a few days. So it was quite successful. Finally, uh, as October drew to a close, the boats started to come around to Dublin to be doing mob for the winter before the weather got too bad and the hours of daylight too short. And we carried out a few mopping ops from Dunleary. So we did a good bit pushing in around Ireland's Eye, and in around Baldwell Spit, and in around the Cliffs of Hope. And then on the south coast, in pushing in in the southwest of Dublin Bay. Also got the mallet working out here in the Irish Sea. It's got a good chunk of land done. And you can see our real map of Ireland's eye is coming on well. Um, so the boats, we only demobbed them last week and they completed their mapping and they'll be tied up in some essential maintenance over winter and that's us done. So thank you all for listening. Feel free to send on questions or comments. And this is just an image taken by own of Skellig Michael. You can see the mallet here in the background. It's just a very good image. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aileen. Uh, I'm just trying to share my own screen here now. So uh, people should remember that all of that was done under the umbrella of what has been a pretty um, challenging year to, 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 uh, to undertake offshore um, operations and activities. So I, I, on behalf of the Inframar board and, and Sean and myself and, and, and the, 
the heads of organizations of the Marine Institute and Geological Survey, huge thanks to the to all of the team, the shore support team, the field team, the vessel support teams that, 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 have, that have done all of this amazing work during, uh, let's say, a, a challenging era, um, which hopefully we we'll, <laughs> we'll never have to face again um, in terms of the constraints and difficulties and with logistics. So uh, very quickly, um, you're, you've all seen the agenda at, at this point, so I'll just get straight into the topic I have to cover uh, on behalf of myself and Sean, which is data research uh, and innovation activities. And I'm just going to give you a, a, sort of a, a whistle-stop tour through a couple of the key things we're doing. I couldn't begin to, to cover all of the project activities uh, during the timeline. Um, just for people who might be new to Infomar, it's a DECC-funded National Seabed Mapping Programme jointly managed and delivered by Marine Institute and Geological Survey Ireland, and it's due completion end 2026. So we are at a point now where we're sort of uh, putting, putting the, the, the countdown clock on to see what we can do in the next few years to really wrap this up and to secure the legacy of what's been effectively 30 years of mapping that the government of Ireland have invested in over various initiatives, PAD offshore, looking at the EZ boundaries, the National Seabed Survey and, and Infomar, the more recent programme. Uh, we really want to maximize the impact and return on investment to the state in, in terms of what we get engaged in by way of research, data products, development, etc. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking towards the end of 2026 and really starting to hone in now on, on sector specific data products um, and, and research activity, uh, trying to get a bit more strategic alignment with what we get involved in. Uh, and we're, we're working towards a program review, which will be uh, a full on uh, assessment of the, the impact and value of, 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 of Infomar to date, which will be done in 2023 and subject to a positive outcome. Um, we will continue to the end of the project in 2026. Uh, and we are on target and, and confident that we, we, will, we will get there. Um, and we're sort of looking forward in the context of, of a transition from this baseline mapping we've always referred to, which is the foundation of, of all, all sort of um, management planning and, 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 and infrastructural development requirements um, towards the sort of a time series monitoring approach to, to what do we need to revisit in the future uh, and, and follow up with future um, uh, sort of time series uh, mapping and monitoring. Some of the data and products work that the team have been doing, there's been a significant amount of work happening in the background. Um, despite the small number of people we are uh, in the program between the two organizations, this is a sub bottom profile viewer. Uh, there's been some development work done. This was launched at the ORE webinar we had earlier in the year. Uh, and there's, there's work happening ongoing on, in developing uh, sort of new content and, and, and the adding, adding new data and reformatting files, archive files to contribute to this service. But it allows a web map service clickable link into these composite maps which show you the sub bottom profile data and the, the uh, bathymetric and backscatter data in a single chart. Um, that's a powerful tool for, for, for development purposes. Uh, the seabed classification maps have been uh, really vastly improved and there's been a huge work uh, ongoing by the team in analyzing and interpreting the, the, the uh, multi-beam data. Uh, and we're starting to look at technology solutions now as to how we can add in imagery and benthic uh, data, video data, uh, that could be sort of the start layer of, of uh, of a time series of, of, of um, imagery and benthic uh, products on top of the seabed classification maps. These points that you see are clusters of sediment samples at this point in time. There's also been a huge amount of work by the, 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 the data folk behind the scenes. Uh, and, uh, and, and in particular, the Marine Institute have been accredited as a national oceanographic data center by the International Oceanographic Data and Information Exchange. Uh, and that's resulted in uh, eight Infomar data sets having fully worked up uh, process flows, which allow us to be able to, let's say, def develop and uh, define reproducible products. Uh, and all of this is backed up by, as I say, data flows and, and, and works, works uh, flows and procedures. Uh, and this has been done across the two organizations where we're doing joint um, uh, quality uh, assessment of some of the, the products and, and data. Uh, in terms of offshore renewable energy development, um, ORDP2 has been supported. Uh, GSI are, are developing the GIS um, uh, function there, and, and we're contributing data. So there's there's weekly meetings to support uh, the activities behind the scenes to to provide the data resources to support offshore renewable energy. Under research and innovation, um, we are uh, involved in various uh, activities. I'll go through these very quickly. 
Action 23 of Harnessing Our Ocean Wealth uh, called for Inframar completion and third level capacity build. And so uh, Janine will talk to the Inframar MSC module that's been uh, developed and delivered uh, to address this and to, to, to grow the capacity and the knowledge uh, in this space. We've been involved in the European uh, EMODnet uh, framework for many years now in terms of um, bathymetry, habitats, geology data compilation. Uh, uh, GSI are going to present on the Cherish project, which is an Ireland-Wales program, coastal and marine heritage focused. Sea Monitor is a project where you've done some baseline mapping to support the, the, uh, the laying of a telemetry network between Ireland and Wales, and that's looking at species migration uh, for management plans development uh, between Mallonhead and Scotland. I, I think I said Wales accidentally there. Um, the European Space Agency Coastal Vulnerability Work that GSI have been doing will be presented by Javi uh, this, this morning. Um, Mission Atlantic, I have a slide on in a moment. Uh, we have funded a postdoc and a Cullen PhD on uh, geomorphology and seabed classification, and that's with UCC. So we're we're collectively working with uh, with with various research partners, but but that's just one one of the, the specific project areas. And we have some European Maritime Fisheries Fund projects coming to an end this year, um, which we've we've uh, done a lot of work on. Uh, two in particular, uh, the SBIR Seaweed Resource Assessment Work will be presented by Fabio. Uh, and I have a slide on the coastal sediment uh, um, topic in, in a minute. Uh, just very quickly on Mission Atlantic, uh, there's three project areas. We manage the uh, lead the, the benthic mapping uh, work package for. And this is about developing a strategic framework for Atlantic bathymetry and benthic habitat mapping to support integrated ecosystem assessment. Uh, and there, it involves uh, seafloor characteristics being, being uh, led by Plymouth, where they're doing habitat mapping layers. And in Norway, uh, IMR are doing future sort of um, distribution of benthic communities based on oceanographic models and predictive models, uh, climate models. So yeah, that's a very quick run through that. There's some tools we're hoping to develop here, which I mentioned already. One is this, this concept of being able to click into a map, uh, select an ROV um, uh, transect, uh, access the metadata, uh, and, uh, and, and basically drill in to replay the high def video footage. And this would be a, hopefully a base layer, foundation layer that we can add to in future years. Uh, and, and we are trying to cast in it wide to add in other Irish data that's been acquired by the research community. This follows uh, work that was done by uh, on, uh, Max Kozachenko helped us with this on an EMFF project previously. Um, very quickly uh, on uh, upcoming events and publications, uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention the fabulous publication by the uh, Cork University Press, the Coastal Atlas of Ireland, uh, which Inframar contributed various articles to our papers too. Uh, we have our webinar today, obviously, uh, which is a replacement for the, the in-person seminar we normally have. Uh, we have uh, Inframar International coming up in February 21. You'll hear more about that uh, shortly. Uh, we have a remote hydrography conference uh, and exhibition, uh, which is linked with that, which Dave Park will speak to. This is my last slide. In terms of where we're going, we're looking at developing the legacy and we're considering how we can support industry and communities, government and research, um, and, uh, and I guess all of this really hinges on uh, the people that work on the program in order to develop the research partners, the capacity build, the time series data products we need to support all this. Uh, so it would be remiss of me not to put a huge thank you to all concerned. Uh, so um, uh, just to mention in passing that one of our key uh, staff uh, in GSI is, is going to be departing shortly. So we want to Relay really huge thanks to, to Ronan on behalf of uh, uh, Marine Institute Geological Survey for all his support. That's it. Uh, and I will stop sharing. And over to you all. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tommy. Um, that was a very nice couple of talks there. A uh, really interesting talk by Aileen there on the, the results of both the MI and GSI mapping operations. And as usual, some fantastic seabed imagery coming out of that. And uh, again, a, a great overview there by Tommy on the sheer breadth of extra work and, and projects that take place um, outside of the core mapping program as well. So I'd like to introduce the ne next uh, group of speakers. This is uh, under the category of uh, National Seabed Mapping Capacity Build. Um, so education, technology and infrastructure is the umbrella there. And we'll have uh, Janine Guinan from the GSI 
uh, speaking about Infomar postgraduate education development. So this, this Infomar MSc module that's been running for the last couple of years, that's been a major development on that front. We'll have Aethon Fitzgerald from RV Ops in the MI uh, talking about the new MI research vessel that's going to be coming online, the RV Tom Green. So that's very exciting. And we'll have uh, Kieran Craven from the Cherish project of which GSI is a partner uh, talking about developments and collaboration in coastal monitoring technology. Good morning, everyone. In this talk, I'll update on the progress of Infomar's postgraduate education development and future plans. So extensive knowledge on seafloor mapping has been built over more than 20 years, beginning with the Irish National Seabed Survey, mapping Ireland's deep water resource, continuing with the mapping of shelf and coastal areas under the Infomar programme. And this knowledge has created not only a valuable national data asset underpinning national policies to manage our seas, but also a highly skilled team with expertise in coastal and marine remote sensing. And over the past two years, this knowledge has translated into a postgraduate education initiative. So this came about within the context of an integrated marine plan for Ireland, which states the need for enabling capacity, education, training, and awareness. More specifically, the Infomar program is tasked with training graduates in marine and seabed mapping technology to support national marine programs, industry, and societal challenges. So first step in developing educational partnerships, um, a host academic partner was identified and Maynooth University came on board. This began the pilot phase with the Department of Geography as part of their MSc in GIS and Remote Sensing. And it's one of Ireland's longest running courses on the subject, accredited by the Society of Chartered Surveyors Ireland and Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. This year then, Infomar have partnered with Ireland's largest university, University College Dublin, for the first time. And the Infomar modules feature as part of their master programs in risk, resilience and sustainability and geospatial data analysis with the Department of Geography. So for us, the goals in delivering the module are to develop modular content that can be tailored to specific educational programs, to identify innovative content with a focus on marine remote sensing techniques delivered through a series of lectures and lab practicals, and at the same time deliver an Infomar specific unique ship based training program where students experience all aspects of C4 mapping. Finally, then the goal is to ensure high standards of teaching are achieved by engaging with the host university. So the level nine postgraduate mod module has been delivered as a combined 10 credit module and also as two five credit modules separating classroom and ship-based learning. 16 lectures cover topics such as multi-beam technology, C4 sediments to survey planning and earth observation. Tutorials provide students with the opportunity to work on real data using industry standard software for multi-beam data processing and cloud computing with satellite-derived bathymetry data. We aim to make the classroom learning as interactive as possible, encouraging discussion and student engagement. Additionally, then, we develop learning outcomes for each lecture and tutorial, and students are provided with learning resources such as video recording summarizing the main concepts, recommended reading, and web resources, which they access through their virtual learning environment. We also prepare multiple choice questions and report assignments on focus topics as part of the module's assessment. This autumn saw the addition of new lectures and tutorials. For example, a lecture in coastal change looks at coastal processes and projecting future change. In the tutorial session, students get to work with real data where they demonstrate and evaluate coastal change. A new lecture describing subsurface imaging provides an introduction to seismic methods and introduces students to geophysical surveys for engineering investigations, with case study examples from Ireland and elsewhere presented to give students real life applications. A new tutorial, Marine Data Science and Product Development, teaches how Infomar data is managed and the benefits of the data to society, policy and the economy with live demonstrations where the students explore the data online 
and access Infomar viewers' story maps and charts. Finally, then, we've developed for the first time a careers focus session, giving students an overview of the different marine sectors, their employment metrics, along with a look at job roles and requirements. We've also included in this panel discussion where members of the Infomar team provide an overview of their different career paths, um, including discussions on training opportunities and um, transferable skills. So the offshore training module is a unique opportunity for graduates and is designed to deliver best practice training in seabed mapping. Students receive an immersive experience spending two days on board a national research vessel, gaining practical hands-on experience in all aspects of research vessel operations. Some of the activities students receive training in are multi-beam and sub-bottom data acquisition, benthic ecology sampling, sound velocity profile sampling, and sedimentology. And this multidisciplinary training is delivered by Infomar staff in collaboration with the Strategic Marine Alliance for Research and Training, or SMART Partnership Programme. Later next year, the student training will move to the new national research vessel, the RV Tom Crean, and the training will adapt to this new infrastructure, which will allow for an increased capacity with the potential for students to overnight on board, um, enhancing the learning experience. So one of our key aims is to connect the learning and practical training with industry requirements. The government's climate action plan just published describes delivering the necessary, quote, increase in upskilling and reskilling to further Ireland's climate agenda. And we see the role of the Infomar postgraduate education program as key to delivering on this through our education and skills training. Our lectures and tutorials focus on industry applications, for example, how reflection seismology can be applied in the context of site investigations for offshore wind turbines. And we provide case study examples where Infomar data has been used by industry to assess route surveys for cable laying projects. Infomar have a continued commitment to deliver excellence in training and education through active and adaptive learning and re-evaluation of course content. This is being implemented in a five-step process involving design content that will help students develop as independent critical thinkers. Implement it and the, implementing the content through engaging with the educational partners applying the teaching methods and, and interactive learning approaches that stimulate and engage students using the latest technologies to enhance learning. And at the same time, inviting evaluation and being adaptable to feedback and ensuring quality and flexibility by improving content design and teaching approaches where necessary. So into the future, we plan to increase lecture and tutorial topics to complete the content all the time reviewing and improving with new innovative approaches to learning and teaching. We will look at diversifying the partnerships, for example, with other universities, stakeholders, for example, government agencies or industry as part of their continuous professional development programs. Finally, then as the module becomes more established, we will look at professional accreditation. So in terms of impacts, we aim to provide the skill set so students are well positioned to obtain graduate work in the marine sector at a time when the sector is growing in areas such as offshore renewable energy, which is projected to have doubling of jobs by 2030. We also see impacts in raising awareness of the value of national mapping program and the importance of data that it generates for the economy. And under the Climate Action Plan 2021, there is a requirement for public understanding of the effects of climate change on the sea. The more people engage with understanding the ocean, the more they will appreciate that it needs to be protected. And we discuss global issues throughout the module, for example, climate change, sea level rise, coastal erosion. And you get a sense that these students are a new generation emerging that know their climate science and are keen to be part of the solution. Finally, then we see Infomar is well positioned to highlight careers in the and training opportunities to postgraduates. We provide extensive resources and we encourage the students to look at all avenues to gaining training and work experience 
and to stay connected to us as they start out on their career paths. And we've supported and supervised students who go on to prepare their projects or thesis on a topic related to the module. Finally, then, we would like to acknowledge the work of the team involved in coordinating this initiative, the university partners who have collaborated on its development and everyone involved. I think the team have really embraced this opportunity to share knowledge um, with the next generation. For more information, see our website or email us on info at infomart.ie. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So I'm going to give you an update on the new RV Tom Cream, which is a big investment by the, the state and Marine Institute in new research infrastructure. So I'm the interim director of Ocean Climate Information Services in the Marine Institute. So just a, a recap on our existing national research fleet. So we have two vessels. Uh, one is the Celtic Voyager, which was launched in 1997, 31 and a half meters long. It can take up to uh, eight, seven scientists and uh, go to sea for about 10 days. And the Celtic Explorer then, which arrived in 2000, late 2002, which is a 65 meter long ocean going vessel, it can take up to 20 plus scientists and it operates over 300 science days per annum. So you can see the sort of a typical year there, uh, two crossings of the Atlantic, a lot of coverage in Irish, UK, French waters, uh, and work in, in the North Sea and the Baltic. So why are we replacing the Celtic Voyager? Well, it's approaching 25 years of age uh, by the time of uh, replacement. We have covered over 460,000 miles since launch, and a lot of the major systems are approaching end of life. Marine science has evolved a lot since the vessel arrived as well, particularly Irish marine science making the vessel unsuitable for many tasks due to the lack of station keeping and limitations on lifting capacity and deck space. The limited endurance can be an issue as well. And this year we had, or this year and last year, were particular challenges with COVID-19. We had to cut down to two scientists for a lot of surveys, uh, but just on the bunk uh, cabin capacity. And we do experience some high levels of weather downtime due to the size of the vessel and what we ask of it, particularly in our far offshore. So the delivery of a new research vessel to replace the Voyager uh, is part of the Marine Institute's strategic plan, identified as a key investment in the, the in national research facilities in the NDP uh, 2018 to 2027. Want to help address some of the research challenges of Brexit and the common fisheries policy. Want to assist in researching climate-induced impacts on our oceans and the further demands under the European Maritime Fund. So the project timeline. So we received uh, confirmation of funding from DAFM in uh, our parent department in 2018. Uh, we ran a procurement process and awarded a design tender to Skip Technus Design from Norway in January 2019. Got to work immediately and we had a basic design completed by the middle of 2019. That helped us then issue a tender for the construction of the vessel in 2019. And then we began a detailed design process in July 2019, including uh, the energy, looking at the energy efficiency aspects. There was a contract for vessel construction awarded to Astilleros Armand and Vigo in December 2019. And then equipment procurement and further detailed design work began then very early in the new year in 2020. Uh, steel cutting commenced then in August 2020, and the key laid was he was laid in November 2020, all on track despite the extreme challenges of the pandemic. And uh, the vessel is to be launched on the 1st of November, uh, sorry, the 19th of November, this Friday in, uh, in Vigo in 2021. And the vessel delivery is planned for Q2, Q3, 2022. So we're delighted that we're, the vessel is going to be floating finally on this Friday. So the outline initial design was for a diesel electric vessel with two generators, roughly three megawatts in capacity, burning ultra low sulfur, sulfur marine gas oil, 52.8 meters in length. A uh, vessel to be designed to meet the requirements of the ICS 209 curve for underwater radiated knives. Uh, accommodation for 12 crew and 14 scientists with an endurance of 21 days and capabilities in the areas of fisheries research, oceanography, hydrography, geology, ROV deployment and body uh, deployment and servicing. So the final design we ended up with, uh, so the length overall didn't change. The beam ended up at 14 meters, gross tonnage of just over 1900 tons. It's uh, classified uh, by Lloyds. It's got an ice class 1C, which is quite a, a, it's a relatively heavy ice class compared to the, the previous vessel. Uh, it's got DP1, up to 21 people. It's got Mitsubishi high-speed engines, uh, it's got a separate harbour uh, set, 
Uh, it's obviously one single electric motor uh, driving a single propeller, a seven bladed propeller uh, to help with the silence of the vessel. It's got a 700 odd kilowatt uh, bow thruster as well, as well as a stern thruster. So in terms of the acoustic serving equipment, it has uh, two, uh, two multi-beams at the moment. One dual RX2040 on a retraction unit uh, forward of the drop keel, with a second backup 2040 on the drop keel. And we, our experience from the Celtic Explorer is that uh, having a multi-beam nine meters down on a drop keel gives uh, you know, the ability to, to work in very uh, high sea states. There's also provision for a more deep water EM712 on the hull forward of the, uh, just forward of the 2040. Uh, there's a sub-bottom profiler, a Knudsen uh, 3.5 and, and 12 kilohertz unit, which is hull mounted up here. And there's a fisheries echo sounder here on the drop keel with uh, five frequencies. It's an EK80 system. There's a long range fisheries sonar, SU93. ADCP fitted here, a 45 kilohertz pinnacle uh, unit, and the ability to fit a 150 kilohertz uh, in here as well. It's got a permanent uh, sonar, Sonardyne Ranger 2 USBL on a retraction unit just uh, aft of the drop keel. And it's also got uh, net monitoring capabilities from using Marport hydrophones in the drop keel. So in terms of oceanographic equipment, it have a 24 bottle uh, CTD unit with uh, 4,000 meters of wire on an active heat comps compensated winch uh, from a dedicated um, launch and recovery unit. It's got the usual underway, um, temperature, salinity, PCO2, uh, and other, uh, other um, water sampling uh, in the bow, and also has a bow met mast for meteorological work. In terms of uh, coring and sampling, it has an eight ton T frame on the starboard side, which can operate up to 4,000 meters of 14 mil dynex, which is ideal for piston and gravity coring, up to 12 meters in length, and box coring. It's also a hydrographic winch for um, day grabs and smaller, smaller sampling devices. There's an oceanographic winch then with two and a half thousand meters of coax, which is a multi-purpose for either towing oceanographic equipment, multi-nets, or side scan deployments. It has a 10-ton A-frame, which is set up for likes of vibe recording, CPT work, and uh, operating a camera sled. It also has a moving vessel profiler on the port gantry. You can just see a shot here of the, the wheelhouse up here, and our large coring winch over here, and some of our fisheries equipment here. So it's you mentioned it can take up to 14 scientists, equipped with the usual stuff, a gym, which is a big improvement on the Celtic Voyager. It's got a good uh, recreational areas. It's got a shore generator for fuel efficiency, all electric winches. It's a multi-purpose design as well, so we can take some items off the main deck as well as when we're changing board. So it has DP1, as I mentioned, using the bow and stern thrusters in the main screw, and it's fitted with a, an anti-roll system for operating in higher uh, sea states. Here's the general arrangement. So basically, on the lower deck, we have all the machinery, the diesel generators, electric motors, auxiliary equipment. Science cabins are on the, on the, on the tween deck here. It's 12 berths here. We have areas like the gym down here, trawl winches down below. Then we have a mess area, uh, oceanographic lab, um, and we have our fish lab here, some crew accommodation and messing and galley here. And mostly crew accommodation on the following floor, uh, following deck, and one or two science cabins in our operation center. Then there's a bridge trunk then that accommodates all the bridge electronics, air conditioning, and other items, and then followed by the, the bridge. And then we have a dedicated MMO station on top of the bridge as well. So the current status of the vessel, it's um, the hull was completed on the 20th of August. This is the current status here. So all the blue blocks are in position and finished and painted. So we're just waiting for the vessel to be launched and to come out of the build shed to have the final platform installed on top of the wheelhouse. So all items like doors, hatches and windows are installed. All the transducers, sub bottom profile or multi-beam and fisheries transducers are all installed. The frames and cranes, are just in the process of being fitted when the vessel comes out of, of the shed. Uh, the wheelhouse was installed in mid-October. Fit-out is continuing with piping, cabling, insulation, and panelling. I believe there's over 80 kilometres of cables going on the ship, so there's a fair bit of pulling the cables required. 
The hull was going to be launched this Friday. We've completed the first part of the dimensional survey for the sub C, the, the hull mounted transducers, and then it will follow on with the, and the, uh, the upper part later on after launch. We, we will start commissioning systems, largely mechanical and ship systems in February, followed by science systems. And then the science trials are planned for April, May 2020. Uh, just a quick note on energy efficiency. We, we took part in the, the SEAI Exceed program, which is the energy efficient design. And we held two challenge and analyze workshops with the vessel designers. And we amended the construction spec somewhat to reflect the output from the workshops. And then the final vessel construction tender had a few options to allow additional energy saving elements. We found that the marine sector was a lot more focused on hull efficiency and propulsive efficiency rather than hotel or on vessel power use. And a lot of standard requirements of EU legislation, such as uh, high efficiency motors, are not applied to the shipbuilding sector. So they're still using IE1 motors as opposed to onshore now, it's IE4 and, and upwards. Uh, our budget wasn't sufficient to make dramatic leaps into alternative fuels, and the vessel size is a limiting factor for many alternative fuel solutions. And then the big challenge is the infrastructure and access to alternative fuels in Ireland is a limiting factor. We've incorporated several energy saving design options. We use this advanced silicon elastomer antifoul, uh, which should last up to 10 years with an annual CO2 reduction of 107 tons. And we have a 400 kilowatt harbor generator for import or as anchor use, and that should use uh, save up to 45 tons of CO2 compared to running one of the main, main uh, gensets. And the vessel is designed to use shore power where available. So we can actually use grid electricity when we're in port. So that's a 300 kilowatt connection. So we should be able to use renewable uh, energy when we're in port, but we just need to get the ports to provide uh, somewhere for us to plug into. So we did look at alternative fuels. Um, basically LNG wasn't feasible due to the lack of refueling infrastructure in Ireland, and also the size of the vessel and the requirement for the uh, high pressure tank and the budget, of course. But we can, they say, reduce up to 25% CO2 with LNG. But the jury is out somewhat on that with the methane slip being a, another factor. Methanol or hydrogen, uh, basically the technology wasn't at a required state of readiness. That's changing now all the time. We looked at hybrid solutions, but the vessel needs an endurance of about 21 days. So it greatly, greatly limits the, the usefulness of, of a hybrid, uh, other than doing peat shaving to avoid starting a genset. We've looked at hydro-treated vegetable oil, or HVO. So this fuel can be used as a direct drop-in to replace marine gas oil. So the vessel's fuel tanks and fuel systems and main engines are compatible. Um, and there is more of this uh, coming on stream. So this may be the optimal solution for at least the, the early part of the vessel's life. And the yard built a previous vessel for Sweden, the RV Svea, and it's currently running a 100% uh, hydro-treated vegetable oil. So just other clean ship measures, You're, the vessel has been built to IMO, IMO tier three limits in terms of uh, emissions, We're using all biodegradable lubricants. The vessel will have a ballast water treatment system compliant with Maripol. And we've just made one side of the vessel for clean water intakes for science and the port side for discharges. Um, the vessel will be extremely silent with its seven bladed, very large propeller. So here's the projected um, noise performance of the vessel. So here are the latest pictures. So the vessel is currently is still in the build shed. It's pretty, it takes half to the water at the moment at high tide. It's raring to go actually. Uh, here's our seven bladed prop. Here's our sub bottom profiler with our 12 kilohertz and three and a half kilohertz transducers, a multi beam behind, and then the drop key behind that. So you can see that the anti foul that has been applied. Here's the EM2014 retraction unit being surveyed in by the surveyor. And you can see the seven data prop again with the vessel ready to go there. So it will be launched back into the water here on Friday. It doesn't have a bulbous bow to increase the acoustic performance. So it actually has a, we we'll say, a large volume bow to give you the, the buoyancy that a bulbous bow would give you, but not create the, the bubbles, which can have an adverse effect on the uh, acoustic uh, transducers. Here's just some more pictures of the interior. That's the fish lab. Here's a very small amount of the cabling that's going in. Uh, here's a view from the upper port gantry. You can see down onto the main deck here. There's a fairly wide side deck. Very good line of sight from the bridge for um, coring other operations. There's our winch with 4,000 meters of Dynex for the deep water work. 
So there, that's it in the yard there now. That's the, the CTD doors here. Um, yeah, so that's the progress at the moment. Another view looking down on the deck. All the winches are electric, provided by Eber Cisa, a, a company from Vigo. And that's it. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak today. Um, what are the main impacts of climate change? This is the question that Cherish is trying to, to address. We are trying to address it by, by using a range of techniques. We're going to go over some of the technology we're applying. Uh, we're also doing it through collaboration, and collaboration is at the heart of, of the Cherish project. We're funded by the EU Ireland Wales program as part of the European Territorial Cooperation program, which looks to encourage organizations from EU member states to collaborate on economic, environmental, and, and social issues. And the four partners involved with the Cherish project from Wales is the Royal Commission on Ancient Historical Monuments, and there is Aberystwyth University, and in Ireland there's the Discovery Programme, and there is the Geological Survey Ireland. And we use the uh, the expertise and the, the experience of the, of the four partner organizations to try and address the issue of the impacts of climate change to sites of cultural heritage. And in terms of what those impacts are, those two images are those three images on the left, uh, the central one being Hurricane Lorenzo before it made landfall in Ireland as a storm, but at the time was the most easterly and northerly category five hurricane in the Atlantic Ocean. And the uh, IPCC report, the, the recent IPCC report, um, suggests that, that these extreme events are going to become more frequent. Uh, and particularly if we look at, at storms, and maybe um, high magnitude wind and rainfall full events, superimposed onto rising sea levels, uh, we're beginning to perhaps look at more coastal flooding occurring, both through um, storm surge and, and on waves coming from the marine side, and also flooding from the terrestrial side coming down, meeting high waters. And so in the Cherish project, we're looking at both Welsh and Irish sites. There's about 13 areas in Wales. There's five in Ireland from Dublin, Wexford, Waterford and, and Kerry, and looking at individual sites of cultural heritage within those areas to try and map monitor and record change to provide data for decision makers to best manage these sites uh, going forward in, in the face of, of, a, of a changing climate. The way that we approach this is to, to try and take a, a holistic view of the coastline to record it using a range of different techniques, building on the expertise of the partner organizations. And uh, I'll focus on some of these, the ones that the geological survey has been uh, applying, such as the uh, the offshore, uh, the vessels that we've been able to, to use the resources of, of the Inframar program, um, vessels like the, the RV Kiri and the RV Lear to monitor and record the seabed and, and wrecks offshore, and to try to tie that on to, to onshore data, which we've uh, acquired in the intertidal and supertidal area using drones, um, using LIDAR from airplanes. We've looked at satellite images for, for regional pictures and knit that together with um, terrestrial laser scanning on coastlines. Our partners have then used a, a lot of the, the other techniques to, to look at more of the, the archaeology and where that sits within the regional picture. And some of the, the dates and some, some of the scale that we've acquired data over, uh, the images on the left then it is uh, satellite data where we've been able to build on experience within the geological survey in other sections of satellite derived bathymetry to get maybe coarse bathymetric maps of some of our coastal areas. Uh, we've then targeted certain areas such as Dublin Bay and the Cherish project in collaboration with, with other Irish research projects such as uh, Acclimatize and uh, Predict uh, are then looking to acquire new data from uh, Dublin Bay and, and hopefully Ireland's eye to be able to stitch together the, the terrestrial um, LIDAR data with the offshore marine data set from, from the Inframar program. We've looked on a, on a kilometer scale, we, we've deployed our, our UAVs um, to look at um, kilometer stretches of, of coastline. The example here is from, from Dublin Bay, uh, again, trying to, to stitch the, the onshore with the, the offshore. Uh, and right down to a, a meter scale, uh, deployed our, 
our scanning total station to look at individual eroding cliff faces and to, to establish that baseline data from which we can uh, monitor future change. And one of the, the key elements that the geological survey has been focusing on is a generation of, of elevation models of our, our coastlines um, to, to then superimpose other data to try and understand what is, is occurring. And one thing that we've done uh, recently is walkover surveys, um, rapid coastal uh, assessments in uh, the area of Rush of North Dublin, where with a... Uh, a laptop where we've been able to geolocate ourselves sorry, with, with, with the tablets, uh, record as we walk along what the erosion is like in that area. And that automatically populates a, a map which can contain our data, our UAV data from that to, to get a, an information on the ground of what is happening to the, the sediments on a uh, down to a, a meter scale. We're then able to, to use um, other sections within the geological survey, specifically the, the coastal vulnerability index that, that's being produced um, and has been produced for the for the east coast. A lot of the inputs into that, the, the wave regime, the, the, the tidal regime can then be used to help inform some of the processes um, that are occurring and, and then some of the impacts that, that we're then observing uh, on the site. This data then gets married to the, the archaeology data and it's being recorded by our colleagues in the discovery program and, and along the stretch of coastline that they've recorded new shell middens um, from potentially about 5,000 years ago uh, and also a I, I believe it's a bronze age burial site that's just been newly e exposed because of the erosion that's occurring and uh, currently along that stretch of coastline. We've also looked at other ways that, that perhaps we can um, monitor our coastline and, and also as research in the Cherish project, we're able to get down to sites uh, perhaps once, maybe up to about twice a year realistically to record change. But we know that erosion is happening continuously um, or that, that erosion is happening ep episodically through the year. And so we've got a collaboration with the Copper Coast Geopark down in County Waterford using their volunteers. We have developed an app that they are then able to to, as they walk a stretch of coastline, record what they see and changes what, what, what they've, they've seen. And so um, they're able to perhaps record the, the length of time they've been there the previously. Have they identified any change? If they have, what is that change? They're then able to take a photo of it, which is geolocated using their, their phone, which again automatically populates a map that we're able to see in real time the data come, come through. And the two images on the left here is some of the, the data that they ha have produced. These are rock falls uh, at coastlines. And we're beginning to maybe be able to um, match what the processes that, that, that are occurring with weather events that are there, be it um, recent rainfall or storm events. And, and that's what we hope to do that is that over time, we might start to see patterns emerging about when some of these events are occurring uh, and are they matched to, uh, to weather events. The image on the, on the right is um, Clean Coast, Antashka's Clean Coast, where we've been in collaboration with them uh, in terms of uh, a beach clean and, and a heritage walk along Bull Island, where we visited some of the, the Cherish uh, sites. Um, it's always good to use existing networks of, of people. The Cherish project is, is young. We don't have our own established um, membership to come to our, our event, but going in collaboration with other ones helps to ensure a high turnout. And it also leads to future things. So once they we've done this event um, and they heard about the coastal monitoring app they're interested in trying that with uh, three of their groups and if that's successful to rolling it out to a, a wider audience looking then at, at some of the the other data that we've collected and the, the assistance that we've got from infomar uh, we have access to the um, the inshore survey vessels, uh, two weeks in Ireland and two weeks over in Wales. And we've been over to Wales four times since, since the start of, of the project. Uh, we've been able to look at offshore sites like islands uh, and reefs to be able to map areas which hadn't been mapped previously into survey shipwrecks and um, 
higher higher precision than had been done previously. And over a number of years, we've been able to map the almost the entirety of the, the ridge along Saren Patrick, where there's lots of shipwrecks, and we're able to see what, what looks like a great big glacial esker sitting along the, the top of that, um, which helps to understand the, the formation of that area and also helps to give the regional context for, for the shipwrecks um, along that, that site, and, and then to match up the offshore uh, story with, with the onshore heritage. The data that we collect, we want to integrate so we can use geological maps um, and, and quaternary maps to, to understand what the coastline is, is composed of, to understand some of the, the processes. And we're also able to stitch the onshore with the offshore. And, and the images on, on the left there of Dorky Island, uh, we have UAV and LIDAR data that was acquired as part of, of the Cherish project. And then the image below it is a seamless coastal terrain model where that has been integrated with the existing Inframar data and also new data that was acquired by the, the RV LUR as part of the, the Cherish project where we've been able to push the vessels up higher to, to try and match it in with the, the terrestrial data that, that we've acquired. The image on, on the right there is of Puffin Island over in Wales, where we have LIDAR data acquired by our partners, the Royal Commission in Wales. And we've then combined that with bathymetry data acquired by the RV Kiri as part of the, the Cherish project using the, the expertise and the, um, the technical knowledge of the Inframar program in assisting with that. And these then help us to understand the um, offshore processes, the hydrodynamic processes that are occurring here that could be impacting the onshore um, cultural heritage. In terms of change, and Cherish is, is interested in looking at, at the change that's occurring at, at these sites. We can look at the historical um, sources and, and the historical maps and, and look at maybe the snapshots in time when the maps are, are produced to look at the, the changing coastline. And the image on the left is of Kilmichael Point in County Wexford. And we're able to see an annualized rate of about 2.2 meters per year uh, as that coastline uh, recedes through erosion. And uh, that can be applied in other areas. The, the other images there is of, of Port Tran in, in County Dublin, where we have both accretion and erosion uh, near that site. But even over the duration of the, the project and uh, in Ireland, um, the, the project been running since 2017, it, it will end in the middle of 2023. So we've been able to survey our sites uh, a number of times. Uh, the image on, on the left there is a DSM of difference of Kilmichael Point in, in County Wexford and Kilpatrick Beach, where it's been color coded, where blue is um, land rise, such as deposition, red is um, land elevation decrease, i.e. erosion. And we are able to see that that erosion can be focused in certain areas, particularly along the sand dunes of Kilpatrick Beach, where over the, the course um, we ha have made between March 2021 and December 2020, uh, we recorded a um, the vegetation line receded by I think it was, it was over 15 meters, which averages out at about six meters per year uh, of, of vegetation line retreat. We're also able to look at in other areas. The, the images, the set of images on the right is from Ross Lair in County Wexford, where we've done UAV surveys in 2017, 2018, 2019. We've done furthers in 2020 and in 2021. And we're able to look at the difference between those, those surveys. Again, color coded. So red is erosion, blue is deposition. And that um, panel D, which is in the, the center there, is different between 2017 and 2018, where there was a little bit of erosion happening. But really, the, a large part happened between 2018 and 2019. That's the image E there on, on the right, um, where we we see a large amount, amount of change and we're beginning to understand the importance of repeat surveys to try and, and build up a picture of, of what's occurring. And we can do this onshore, we can also do it offshore. So again, using um, the, the collaboration with Inframar and the data from Inframar, uh, they surveyed the City of London wreck in 2015 off the coast of, of Wexford. And then Cherish has returned with the ORV Kiri in 2018 and 2020. We've also gone back in 2021 to resurvey it. And we're able to build up a, a complex uh, story of, of change occurring in this, in this area. These, these are the, the central images um, where blue is deposition, red is erosion. And starting at the top there, between 2015 and 2018, we see deposition in the area, followed by beneath that uh, erosion, where there's a lot of red between 2018 and, and 2020, such that the, the medium term change, um, the one at the very bottom, is one of erosion occurring at this, this site. And again, is the repeat surveys, which allows to build up this this picture uh, of what's happening.
We also have collaborated with the University of Limerick and, and they put their ROV uh, on board, the ROV Kiri. And we have been able to survey the uh, La Surveillance in Bantry Bay and Manchester Merchant in, in Dingle, uh, take video and, and images to produce photogrammetry of these wrecks, which will then be able to um, stitch with the, the bathymetry that where it was acquired by, by the Kiri uh, at those sites. And we're looking forward to seeing the data coming from that in the next few months. So just to, to finish up, um, all the data that the Cherish project produces is freely accessible. We'll be re releasing it through portals of, of each of the, the different project partners that there's already UAV data up on the GSI's open topographic uh, viewer. This data then acts as a baseline from which the Cherish project itself can monitor change, but in the future, other organizations can also measure change to try and understand that the processes that, that are occurring. And we're looking at them producing detailed management plans uh, for our key sites so that they can be best managed uh, going into the future in the face of, of a, a changing climate. And we are, are looking at really getting this, this data and information into the hands of local communities so, so that they're able to use it, so that it can benefit their areas uh, and, and benefit the, the blue economy. Um, and on that, I'd like to say thank you very much to you all for, for listening. So thank you. Thanks very much for that, Kieran, uh, and to the previous speakers, to Aidan and Janine. Um, I, I think that's a really good sort of run into the, the next session, which is based on scientific monitoring for resource and change management. So, you know, we've, we have the knowledge, we have the infrastructure, and we have the data know-how to start to, to, to provide data to support change monitoring and change management. So uh, the first speaker in the next session will be Glenn Nolan from Marine Institute here, and uh, he'll give an update on the climate report. Uh, then Javi Montes will talk to the monitoring coastal change from space in Ireland, uh, followed by Fabio Sicchetti from Marine Institute, giving a presentation on the technology applications in seaweed resource assessment. Uh, and then last uh, slot in this session is from Ollie Tully, Oliver Tully, uh, who's going to talk about sea bathymetry and classification data informing coastal biological community distribution and monitoring. Uh, so that's a habitat focused uh, presentation. So over to you, Glenn. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to all the Infomar stakeholders today. I just want to give a very quick update on where we are with uh, marine climate change. And Kieran kind of touched on that, and I think Javi will as well in, in his in the next talk. Uh, but just to give you a sense of where the thinking is on uh, climate services, really, in the Marine Institute over the next uh, ten minutes or so. And uh, just like to acknowledge that Carolyn Cusack and Deirdre to Fitzhenry in particular in the Oceanographic and Climate Services team are a great help in pulling together this presentation. So uh, there is an interesting landscape at the national level uh, for, for marine climate services. So this is the, the landscape at the national level, uh, various adaptation plans that feed into the Climate Action Plan. And you'll see that there's, there's 12 plans, 12 adaptation plans across seven government departments that are uh, currently in place. So these were produced in 2019 and updated or will be updated very, very soon. And in the bottom panel, we've kind of been doing a little bit of soul searching in the Marine Institute to see uh, how we can configure the science that we do, the infrastructure that we have, uh, the different people that we have around the, around the system, projects that we fund externally and so on to deliver into various adaptation plans. The red arrow there signifies the, the link to our parent department and the seafood sector adaptation plan, which is probably the biggest focus that we have, but it doesn't mean that we can't work uh, in partnership with other uh, state organizations to deliver services to some of them as well. So the framework for climate services within the Marine Institute, we need to harvest all the different requirements that you saw on the previous uh, slide from as many of those adaptation plans as is necessary. And then we have three pillars, if you like, of the climate services uh, that, that then seek to address those requirements. We have an observations pillar, all the different things that we measure out in the ocean. Uh, we need to increase our understanding of the key processes to uh, deliver climate services. And we need to also be able to project what's going to happen in the future. And I think the, the key take home from this is that we would try to do this in a what you would call a co-development environment. We've already had some discussions with GSI, EPA and many other stakeholders about how we co-develop climate services and indeed with Met Aaron, because a lot of the applications, they traverse the marine and atmospheric boundaries. So you can't really look at things in isolation anymore. It has to be multidisciplinary, multi-agency, multi-department uh, approach. So we've, as I mentioned at the start, we've done a bit, a bit of soul searching within the MI and we have about 28 people involved in uh, climate work. 
but unfortunately it's not it's very few of those people's day jobs to to work on climate related activity if you if you sum up the 28 of them it adds up to about one and a half full-time equivalents and we also fund a lot of external projects and we're involved in other climate projects when you look at those externally funded projects we've about 21 full-time equivalents in those and we fund a few MSCs and PhDs as well and we have various pieces of infrastructure that you can see on the right of this slide including the research vessels that Adon talked about gliders um, sea level gauges the glass gauges the marine data boy network and so on so we've quite a complex uh, ecosystem and largely an outsourced model for providing climate services at the moment. We have three major deliverables from our climate program this year. The first one is a baseline report on essential ocean variables. That's complete. So we've looked at all of the essential ocean variables that are listed by Global Ocean Observing System. And we've looked at our state of readiness for all of those variables. And that report is available and I'm happy to circulate it to anybody who's interested in it. I have a couple of snapshots into it in a couple of, couple of moments. Um, we're developing, it's an internal report, what we call a climate foresight report or roadmap to see how Marine Institute might configure itself in the future to provide climate services. That'll be published in the next uh, two weeks, I would say. And the other major report we're doing is an update of the 2009 Ocean Climate and Ecosystem State Report uh, to summarize what has happened in all the major parts of food webs, ocean chemistry, and ocean physics over the last couple of decades. And that will be produced in quarter one of 2022. So just to give you a flavor of what was in this baseline report that I talked about, we looked at, we looked at it by essential ocean variable. And you can see three of those essential ocean variables here. In the left-hand panel, we have what you call a heat map uh, of, of sea surface temperature. So this is a combination of the different buoys that are located around the coast, some coastal stations at Ballycotton and Mallon Head, uh, and then also superimposed on that the vessel underway uh, sea surface temperature data. So you can see the hotspots around Galway, Cork and Dublin, where we tend to have an awful lot of data. Um, I'd say we have very good data coverage at each of the buoy locations that you see there as well. And these heat maps give us an idea of where we're doing a good job of monitoring some of these essential variables. The middle panel is of ocean carbon. So we've had quite an active program out in the Rockall Trough uh, for 2000, you know, since about 2005 or six. Uh, and we have routine monitoring around the coast as well for dissolved inorganic carbon. Um, so that, that there are those transects that you can see quite close to the coast that extend offshore. And on the fishery side, the, the right-hand panel, you can see some examples of fish distribution uh, from the various major surveys that we do on behalf of the government in any, in any given year. So fish distribution and abundance is actually essential it is an essential ocean variable. And we want to just to understand uh, the data sets that we've collected. And this is between 2008 and 2020. That's just a close up of the heat map for, for temperature. We've done this for all the different essential ocean variables. The other thing that we've done uh, is we've worked very closely with our colleagues in ICHEC in the Irish Center for High-End Computing to downscale. A couple of people earlier mentioned the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. Uh, they produce model outputs and projections at quite a coarse scale. That's quite a challenge uh, to use in an Irish context. And what Paul Nolan and colleagues in ICHEC have done is they've downscaled the IPCC, what they call the CMIP-6 projections, uh, to Irish waters. And you can see the domains of interest there in the panel on the left-hand side. I've always, uh, I've always talked to Tommy and Coon Brugan and colleagues about a map in the Celtic Sea. Uh, uh, because it's a very important area and it's great to see uh, in the presentations earlier that that mapping is still, not, still ongoing and we're, we're gradually building up a picture of the Celtic Sea but we are developing a projection model for the Celtic Sea uh, that is shown by the red box on the, the panel on the right and uh, that will be a biophysical model it's a project called BioCeltic funded under the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund and we hope to have results from that model under several uh, emission path scenarios available in the next two to three months. Um, and we'll have, as I say, both biological, chemical and physical variables within that model domain available for anybody who wants to use those projections. The other thing that we've done, um, it may be int interesting to some people more focused on the biological aspects of, of our, our waters. We've, as part of the Coalcline project, we've developed a, a model of the Southwest coast of Ireland. And one of the things we've looked at is heat waves. Um, so marine heat wave is when the temperature exceeds a particular threshold for five days in a row, basically exceeds the long-term mean. 
and uh, we can look at the duration of these events, we can look at whether they're going to become more frequent or not. And this is just an example from Danish Island, which is an aquaculture site. And I think the first presentation actually focused in on some of the mapping down in, in that area earlier this year. And we can see these peaks, these red peaks in the panels on the right hand side for surface and bottom waters where you have marine heat waves uh, that have an effect on aquaculture and on juvenile fisheries and, and so on. And we can do this from 1970 to 2035 now. So we have those data stored. And over the next couple of years, we'll extend the uh, climate projections to cover the entire Irish coastal area uh, and more state variables in the model as well. So that we can underpin uh, policy advice with that as well. Final thing I wanted to show was, was uh, it was one of the interesting things we, we picked up from our interactions with stakeholders on the climate side of things is, um, we have climate action regional offices within many of the local authorities. And typically what happens there is that non-specialist staff, so these would be people without a scientific or engineering background, uh, they end up working in the climate action regional office because they know climate is a very interesting, uh, fascinating area. And one of the challenges they have is to actually explain climate change to the public. And this is just an example of a recent infographic that we did with the climate action regional offices uh, on harmful algal blooms, just to explain what a harmful algal bloom is, uh, what are the effects of a bloom, how is it likely to change over time, and what preparedness uh, can we put in place to mitigate the effects of harmful algal blooms in the future. So we're continuing this work in ocean climate literacy, if you want to call it that. We're continuing our work in beefing up our observations in an Irish context, uh, and we're continuing our work in terms of understanding climate impacts and also in terms of projecting what's going to happen in the future. And that hopefully provides some form of overview of our active areas of work in the climate area at the moment. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Xavier Montes, Senior Geologist at the Geological Survey Island. I'm going to briefly unveil some of the insights in how we monitor coastal change from space primarily from satellite, but with some links and reference to urban and advanced land mapping techniques. This is relevant in the marine context we are here today, as the near shore environment, the intertidal and down to the surf zone especially, are often the more dynamic and challenging and map areas in the world, in Ireland for instance, and they are precisely a key component in understanding coastal processes and the associated changes. We're going to go over some background information on coastal change, then on how we measure these changes using images to finally see some examples and applications. We can see the Sentinel-2 constellation here, which is composed of two satellites, how they track to cover every inch of the earth, which normally takes approximately five days. In Ireland, we have repeated surveys every 3.5 days. This high temporal resolution has revolutionized the way we monitor our coasts. It's primarily the power of the sea that has shaped Ireland's recent coastline into what we can observe today through the various coastal processes, including erosion, transport, and accumulation of sediments. Some of the processes of coastal erosion operate at several scales, not just on the physical, but also on the temporal domain. Some processes just take hours, like tides or days, for instance, storms, years to decades, like the North Atlantic Oscillation to millennia, more like on the geological process such as the tectonic movements and also threats of like the sea level rise from short to long term. Typically coastal change happens gradually by a combination of these factor and processes, but big changes mainly take place after unique events such as storms or storm surges that can have significant impacts in very short time windows. So again, if we want to understand what happens to a particular area we have to be looking at past records and correlating them to events so we can better model the coastal processes. Erosion in the coast takes place when material is removed and carried away. Well, the result is quite simple to understand that drivers can be complex. Ireland is quite a unique place compared to mainland Europe because large parts of our coastline, particularly on the East Coast, were shaping the most recent quaternary age and the glacial conditions. As a result, we have soft sediments, till and gravel left behind by the glaciers, and these are not compacted, so making it very easy to be eroded. This, combined with increased storminess and higher water levels that we are seeing today, make large areas of the coastline susceptible to be eroded. Here you can see 
few examples from Portland where active erosion has been going on for decades and that has been increased recently. Kilpatrick Beach in North County Wexford, which is a European recognized habitat for wildlife. This has been destroyed in the recent storms and has been endangering nearby homes. Poland Strand in County Donegal, where in 2020, approximately 50 meters of the coast were wiped off and also affected the nearby pathways. Coastal accretion on the other side is the deposition of sediment, usually sand, which is evident by the seaward advance of a shoreline indicator. So it's important to recognize that while the process can be considered inverse to erosion, the results are different from the original as the combination is generally loose and unconsolidated. So it forms a pit on a part of the beach, for instance. We can see Bull Island, a five kilometers long sand pit on the north wall of Dolin Port, developing following the construction of the north wall during the first half of the 19th century. Since then, it has grown, showing aggression for many years. However, nowadays erosion is happening in the north and even more accentuated after the storms. So any human intervention in the coast is likely to have some impacts. And this is a good example that we are seeing here. When walls or coastal defenses are implemented, they might protect a cliff at that precise point, but it might cause even more erosion in adjacent areas or sediment starvation on a place nearby. Another important aspect of coastal change, sometimes neglected in studies, is the change of land cover land use. Land cover maps are a basic sort of information to track the impact that human activity, natural processes, and climate change have on coastal areas. A pioneer of that was the Korean land cover inventory initiated back in 1985 with several updates till now 2018. While the Copernicus Sentinel-2 mission delivers ideal images to map land cover, but producing huge amounts of time series data that have to be processed. To make this possible, the ESA funded the Sentinel-2 for Science land cover project, which explored novel cloud computing technologies and machine learning to automate this mapping. As a result, Europe land's cover has now been mapped showing 13 land cover classifications, which they can be used to inform other applications. Coastal managers use land cover data and maps to better understand the impacts of natural phenomena and human use of the landscape, such as coastal flooding or storage shortages. So they're very powerful when looking at change of land cover. Let's see how we monitor changes along the coast, what methods we use. We can do topographic surveys to detect changes on elevation profiles from GPS to mobile mapping systems that include LiDAR and optical cameras. Data collecting using this technology has allowed us to build accurate elevation models on the coast so we can manage, monitor 3D change over time and ranging from millimeters to centimeters of accuracy. Airborne surveys allow us to map large areas in very short time windows using photogrammetry or LiDAR and then work in a similar fashion than previous methods calculating 2D or point cloud volumetric changes. So large areas, but to a higher cost. We are here in the tens of centimeters of accuracy. Satellite monitoring techniques, such as the latest ESA coastal erosion GSIs involved, allow us to map even larger areas and longer time spans since the 80s, 1980s. However, to a lesser degree of accuracy and only in 2D. So mapping shorelines to measure coastal migration. We are here on the meter resolution. The advantage is that satellites do not stop and keep us providing with good quality measuring. And also very important, important science, for example, with dedicated apps, which allow the local community to add information about erosion events happening near their homes. A powerful concept to understand when monitoring from the space is the spatial resolution. Satellite digital data are scanned from an area coming out in the form of individual image points, so-called pixels. A pixel can be defined as the smaller area unit in a digital image. The size of the pixel determines the spatial resolution of this image. Spatial resolutions can vary from centimeters, for example, military sensors, to kilometers, meteorological satellites. In between, we find the ones that we normally use. Here we have an example of four different spatial resolutions for typical optical satellites. The same location for TRAN, we see how different resolutions allow us to see coastal features in more detail. For monitoring coastal change, we typically employ resolutions of less than 10 meters. However, for other applications, such as land cover, resolutions can be more adequate if they are larger. 
Sometimes there is less interference from adjacent pixels. Let's dive now into how we measure shoreline change from images to illustrate what exactly are we monitoring. Shoreline change has been measured from a series of images, including orthophotos and satellite, where the coastline, for instance, the vegetation line, has been digitized. This is an example of a shoreline digitized in North Dublin between 2000 and 2020. The total number of shorelines used vary at locations depending on image availability and accuracy. Parallel transects perpendicular to the coastlands are then drawn from a defined baseline. These transects intersect the digitized lines at fixed points that the system will use for calculations of distance over time. Then it uses a weighted regression model that quantifies the magnitude and direction of the change. So whether it's aggression or erosion and identify cyclical trends. Let's now have a look at the results from the large and northern Dublin area, an example of calculations in Rush Portran, where erosion rates have been a concern for a number of decades. In recent years, coastal erosion has accelerated and the seas are starting to get closer to private property near the beach. We've measured shoreline change looking at data back 25 years. The level of change is not constant and it varies from a few centimeters to meters every year. We can see how the erosion here displayed in red in the, south, in the south part of Portrain, while accretion is happening just on the northern part in the estuary. There are hotspots in the borough and north Portrain with erosion rates, they range between two and four meters per year, so quite severe. And it's also significant to note how in the last five years, there's been an increase in the rate of this erosion, which up to five meters a year. For that reason, the area is currently under complex coastal defense strategy coordinated by the local authority, and the OPW. This is a clear example where detailed monitoring of coastal evolution is key, particularly in vulnerable areas, to obtain success in future adaptation plans. It's important to note that we can also measure coastal change employing other remote sensing methods, independent from the image-based method uh, displayed before. In this case, the target is to delineate the foot of the cliff using automatic algorithms that detect changes in curvature. We use digital evaluation models from different years and measure the migration of these lines perpendicular to the coast over time. And this is in fact one of the best proxies for measuring true erosion at the foot of the slope. The difficulty resides in finding good quality digital elevation models. The results then can be used to validate the image-based approach we've seen before. One of the climate-related products GSI has been recently developing Receiving inputs from the coastal erosion outputs we've seen before is the CVI thematic map, Coastal Vulnerability Index map, showing ranges of vulnerability from low to high for every point of the coast, depending on whether a particular area is more or less susceptible to change as sea level rises. Some of the advantages of applying an index-based approach resides in the clarity of the results. So this map can be used as a starting point in the adaptation process. This map has been recently featured in the new Coastal Atlas of Ireland, which provides me the perfect excuse to close the presentation with a cover of this atlas led by the UCC Press, a titanic effort that place, has placed the Irish coast on the front page of every home in Ireland. And with this, I finish and thank you for your time. Good morning, everybody. My name is Fabio Sacchetti. I work in the Marine Institute for the Informa program. And today I am going to give you a quick overview of uh, a project that we have been managing for a couple of years. The project is about the development of uh, new high tech solutions for seaweed resource assessment. So, first of all, a little bit about seaweed. Uh, seaweed cultivation market size worldwide is estimated to be between 11 and 14 billion uh, this year, last year, and it is projected to be about 50 to 60 billion in 2040. So it is a fast growing market. In Ireland, the Ireland is the third highest producer of uh, seaweed in Europe behind Norway and France, and approximately 40,000 tons of wild seaweed are harvested annually. Uh, it is a raw ingredient for cosmetics, biopharmaceutical, human and animal food, and feed, and it has a future potential for many sectors, including carbon sequestration. Many compounds are discovered and extracted every year, so it's just a very fast growing market. Approximately, there is between 150 and 300 um, harvesters in the country from small families, 
harvesting the local beach to more bigger commercial entities. So as the market increases over the next couple of decades, it is important to introduce the sustainability into the market. The seaweeds are, are an important habitat often found in the marine protected areas and special labor conservations. They provide shelter for many uh, species. They play a key role in coastal ecosystems. They help to protect the coastline and reduce coastal erosion and also help to increase carbon sequestration. So it is very important to protect uh, this habitat as well. As such, sustainability must underpin the licensing regime for seaweed harvesting. There is the need to develop st standard methodologies for resource distribution and biomass assessment, which will ensure the sustainable development of the sector, define sustainable level of harvesting, and minimize environmental impact. So this become a reality in 2018 when the National Marine Planning Framework report was issued. And within the report, there is a particular section about seaweed and specifically, the Marine Institute is challenged with a couple of aspects. One is to better understand the socio-economical aspect of the sector, and two, to improve the way the resource is monitored, mapped, and assessed. And uh, in particular, Infomar within the Marine Institute was challenged with the mapping aspect because we are the mapping experts, if you want. The, uh, even before uh, the report was issued, we already had a PhD student in, in house in AMS that was already looking at the technology aspect of mapping seaweed, uh, looking at drones, looking at multispectral spectral cameras. And one thing that the PhD student looked at is also the commercial availability of services. And it is quickly discovered that uh, neither in Ireland or UK, there are, there are no companies specialized in mapping uh, this type of resource. So that sparked interest, obviously. Uh, we went back to the e European Maritime Fisheries Fund looking for funding to develop this further. And we eventually were granted 250,000 euro that were used, that they're currently used to do two things. One, we did an infrastructure tender in 2020, which I will show you in a minute. And then we also engaged with the Enterprise Island uh, within the SBIR funding scheme. So first of all, a uh, quick overview of what we procured. So we did a, a tender early last year. We procured both an spectral camera and uh, a commercial drone. While currently most companies are using both the spectral camera to do all sorts of surveys uh, with drones, uh, we decided that hypsospectral spectral is really the way forward for many, many sectors, for many, many things. Uh, Apple spectral is, is more it brings much more data into, into the, uh, the equation and the potential are really endless with hyperspectral solutions, but it brings also challenges, in particular the amount of the volume of data that these kind of cameras are, 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 are acquiring is quite substantial. And we procured also a commercial drone, as you can see here, which we will need to uh, fly the camera. But more importantly, we used the majority of the funding to engage with Enterprise Islands through the Small Business Innovation Research funding mechanism. So SBIR is a pre-commercial, multi-phase procurement method. It enables public bodies to stimulate innovation when goods and services are currently not available in the marketplace. In simple terms, if a, a public body needs to do something, needs to procure something, but there is nobody out there that can actually deliver, this is a mechanism to provide funding to companies to become competent into niche markets, to become competent in delivering these kind of services. And the beauty of this system is that the companies, they do retain their IP, so eventually in the future, they can also commercialize it. So what we did, we developed a challenge and the challenge was then issued through a tender mechanism early last year. And the challenge that we issued uh, is to develop a technology focused data acquisition, processing and analytical solution that is capable of delivering a rapid and cost effective intertidal species level seaweed distribution assessment at a regional scale. So it is important to, uh, to, to, to look at some of these keywords because it's very critical that the companies deliver. The solution that we want the companies to devel develop has to be rapid, has to be quick, you know, can be delivered in, in a matter of weeks, and it has to be cost effective. So having, for example, 50 marine ecologists on kayaks or ribs and GoPros on the beach looking at seaweed distribution is not what we're looking for. We want something a little bit more high tech. 
we also want the solution to be able to discriminate between species. So it's not enough for a solution to just say, yes, there is seaweed or no, there is no seaweed. We know the solution to tell us, yes, there is that species of seaweed in that particular area. And also the solution has to be scalable from local to, to regional scale. So as I mentioned, the, 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 the funding comes from both Enterprise Island and uh, the Marine Institute. Uh, the total pot is about 300,000, is, it, it is 300,000 300, euro, and the Marine Institute component comes from EMFF funding. The fund is managed by uh, ourselves in the uh, AMS group in Infomar, and uh, I am the manager of the SBIR together with Thomas Fury. So we issued the tender last year and seven consortia applied for the, for the tender and we selected three of them. The AAT consortia, Fathom consortia and the Teco Marine consortia. So quick overview of these companies. AAT is an ag aerial agri-tech uh, specialized in all sorts of uh, things. Um, they're specialized in flying fixed wing drones with multi-spectral sensor, and they provide services for forestry and agriculture. And now they will also include services for mapping seaweed. The Teco Marine uh, Consortia, uh, Teco Marine is, is a Dublin company specialized in all sorts of marine services, and they joined forces with Geoaerospace and NUIG in Galway. And then Fathom is an IT company, and they uh, joined forces with uh, two groups in the new IG and also Aramara Theo, which is the biggest commercial harvester in the country. So I will give you a quick overview of their solutions. And I will, I, I have merged AAT and the TechWork Marine Solution because they are very similar. So AAT specialized in uh, flying fixed wing, drone, fixed wing drones with uh, uh, multispectral sensors. Uh, the tech marine was slightly different. They prefer to use uh, uh, multi-rotor drones and uh, airplanes to fly, again, multi-spectral, but also hyperspectral sensors. These high-resolution data collection systems, they're also coupled with uh, uh, satellite remote sensing uh, type of uh, uh, image analysis to, for, to cover the regional uh, uh, aspect of the challenge. The data sets delivered by these platforms are then brought into a GIS environment where they are analyzed using a combination of uh, machine learning, cloud computing, uh, neural network type of algorithms uh, to basically derive uh, seaweed species classifications. And these classifications are then validated through ground truthing work on the, on the shoreline. And then the final data sets are delivered through client-based service platforms like WMS services, or web-based web portals. The Fathom solution instead is a little bit different. The, the solution currently developed by Fathom is, is very different because, uh, well, Fathom is a software company with uh, considerable experience in uh, software development in the cloud. So their approach is mostly focused on using the best satellite images uh, available currently commercially, which can achieve a resolution of few decimeters. And the platform that they are currently developing is totally cloud-based and will avail of uh, the power of Amazon Web Services uh, and will include advanced artificial intelligence and neural network models capable, of, capable to predict the spatial extent and biomass uh, of selected seaweed species with current focus being on the Ascophila nodosa, which is the, 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 the most important commercial uh, seaweed in the country. The final uh, pl platform, the final portal, which will be available to clients through the web, but also through apps, uh, will be able to automatically select the best satellite images for specific area, run the models and generate accurate estimators of seaweed species distribution and biomass. And obviously being the solution completely cloud-based and mostly rely on satellite data, it can be easily applied anywhere else in the world and customized to fulfill different custom needs, customer needs. <coughs> so the companies went through a phase one uh, uh, period, about four months, where they were given a small amount of money, about 30,000, 40,000 euro. And what they did, they, they created a case study. They went on the field and then they demonstrated that they can deliver the, the solution. This is, for example, some data sets acquired by AAT on the Iron Island where they have their commercial partner. So they demonstrated that they can discriminate between seaweed species here on this area, for example. Then 
early this year in January, the, pro, the SBIR went, went into phase two. Basically, we reviewed the results of the phase one and we decided to bring forward two consortia, AAT and Father Consortia. AAT also expanded the consortia. They brought in Copernicus. They brought in a company from Italy, which is uh, specialized in marine remote sensing and, and, and so on. And phase two really has been the uh, they, they, they look deeper, they, they, they challenge the technology even deeper, they went on the field more, and now we are toward the end of phase two, and the companies are looking at market analysis, and they are finally commercial, trying to look at co commercializing their solution for future uh, tenders. The phase two will, uh, will be completed in, uh, in December this year. And what the companies have been doing, for example, AAT has been in the field quite a lot. They surveyed all over the country from Mayo, Cork, Kerry, Waterford, all the way to Malinhead in Northern Ireland. And they really wanted to get a better understanding of seaweed environment. Mapping seaweed is not straightforward. It is a very challenging environment which constantly changed throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the months. So creating, um, so understanding these and creating a good knowledge of this kind of environment is important for companies that are flying drones, for example. They also, uh, so, so they learned that they, they had to adapt to the camera system. They changed the type of drones they're flying. They also understood their daily limit, how much kilometer they can cover in, in, in a day, which is important when you are then looking at scaling these at the regional scale. And uh, ultimately, I suppose, uh, we, we also tried to challenge the companies, trying to look beyond the seaweed concept. Uh, so AAT has been looking at potential of mapping uh, salt marshes, for example, which is a key uh, habitat for carbon sequestration. They looked at the potential of using drones to map uh, plastic and to monitor seabirds, marine, marine life, and, and so on. And ultimately, what we have been doing here in the last year, year and a half with these companies to to, to make them uh, capable of tackling multiple challenges. Once the companies have the correct solution, they have cracked, if you want, the uh, cloud computing, the machine learning, the neural network algorithms, and they have the correct technology, the same technology can also be applied to uh, other aspects of the marine environment. Today's seaweed, Tomorrow, it could be salt marshes, sea grasses, marine pollution, and so on. So the companies are biting into these kind of niche markets, and hopefully they will be able to expand their portfolio in the future uh, for multiple uses. So that's pretty much uh, my 10 minutes up. If you have any further questions, you can email me or my, uh, my uh, manager, Thomas Fury, at marine.ie. So thanks for listening, and uh, I hope you enjoy the uh, remaining of the conference. Good morning. Uh, I presume you can see my screen. Uh, I'm uh, Oliver Tully. Uh, I work in uh, fisheries in the Marine Institute and I'm going to talk to you today about just uh, some programs and uh, projects we're engaged in in the monitoring of marine uh, benthic habitats and development of methods for, for the same. So I work with um, uh, in fisheries but also fisheries environment interactions especially within the Natura 2000 uh, Marine Protected Area Network and in, the, in these projects we work closely with the Inframar team, with the Emer O'Keefe especially, and with our contractors in Merck, uh, that's Louise Scali and, and Nick Pfeiffer, and our funding comes from the EMFF uh, Marine uh, Biodiversity Scheme. So uh, our objective is to develop methods for, for monitoring of uh, marine seafloor communities, benthic communities. And the objective and basis of using the Inframar data would be that variables that are derived from the Inframar bathymetry can be used to characterize seabed terrain. And importantly, that offers a valuable tool for delineating regions that are likely to support different uh, biological, biological communities on the seafloor. There's a question mark over that and how we might detect that relationship uh, if it exists. But if it's true, then it provides a basis for stratification uh, of biological sampling programs. And really importantly, it provides a basis for habitat modeling. In other words, extending um, extending the, the information on distribution and, and structure of seafloor communities based on the fact that the Inframar data provides 100% ground cover. And you can do that then if, if, there, if, if the terrain data and the biological data are, are well correlated. And so that's, where, that's really what, uh, what we're about. Um, why would we do that? Well, uh, there's 
an onerous list of requirements, really, um, that the Marine Institute or other agencies are required to report under uh, under various articles of various directives. Uh, the National Parks and Wildlife Service need to report under Article 17 on the status of uh, status and change. And there really is a big data deficiency in that respect in the in the reporting of the status of reef habitat in particular. And that's an annex one habitat in the, in the directive. The Institute itself, and this is work we do in fisheries, is responsible for Article 6 assessments of the effects of fisheries and aquaculture. And they, you know, that's an onerous requirement. The bar is set high there. We have to prove negative, uh, the absence of significant effects. So how do you do that in the absence of uh, good information on biological communities on the seafloor? Same true with uh, the MSFD, the assessment of GES, good environmental status in, in that directive. Um, again, uh, the Marine Institute reports uh, that and advises the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government on, on GES. The Institute also uh, monitors transitional waters and for the framework direct, water framework directive. And I guess two, two uh, newer requirements uh, and, certain, and the last one, the Marine Protected Area Network on, is on the horizon. Irish government policy now is to expand the uh, the area of the network to thirty percent of the of the Irish territory. You know that, that's that the, the optimum design of that really uh, needs better information on, distri on distribution and status of uh, underlying habitats. Okay, so we have two projects uh, operating uh, really in one since 2017-18, one on, in, on the southwest coast to look at the extent of reef habitat and how it supports the distribution of, of crayfish, uh, spiny lobster habitat, uh, the ca carrying capacity of that, of that habitat, uh, and the potential for restoration, given that these, these populations are somewhat depleted because of the effects of historic fishing. Also, this is a, an Article 6 assessment, perhaps, of the effect of, fishing, of removal of crayfish, which is a, a keystone species, let's say, on reef habitat, what the effect of removal of that would be or is on, on reef, uh, reef communities. And to know that, of course, we have to know the structure of uh, the communities in the first place. And in addition to the, the terrain data uh, derived from, from Inframar and the biological sampling uh, data that we get from underwater uh, methods provided by Merck, we also have fishery data, which we're gradually building up. So we're able to overlay the fishery data uh, on top of the terrain data, maybe at different resolutions, but nevertheless, we're able to interpolate and, and demonstrate small scale kind of spatial variability in abundance of various species which are living close to or on or on reef. That's an example of the what uh, on the bottom there what the what crayfish habitat might look like underwater. Uh, you know, rocky platform with steep gullies and and, and ledges. Uh, which provide habitat for for uh, for for crayfish. So our approach uh, has been to to study in detail uh, half a dozen sites there, um, from Galway inside the Aran Islands down to the west coast, west of Clare and the, and, and North Kerry, and derived various terrain de derivatives from uh, from the bathymetry data, including you know the slope, rugosity, aspect. Uh, variability, um, and then to explore the relationships between that terrain data and the uh, uh, and the biological and the biological data, acquiring biological data on georeferenced uh, video transects, uh, stills, etc. And there's an example there on the bottom, which where we can, in fact, place a, a, a video on an area of low slope versus a, a, a video transect on on high slope. So we're already beginning to uh, stratify our sampling uh, according to the underlying uh, underlying terrain. But there's a question mark, you know, does, does terrain matter? Um, so does it matter whether this, uh, these photographs, there are obviously different communities there, but does it matter, does the terrain, the, the, the fact that it's a horizontal platform as opposed to a vertical platform, uh, as opposed to a rocky, uh, a boulder outcrop, uh, is, is that important? And there's a very simple analogy, I think, uh, where to look at terrain that you can actually see. Uh, if, you, if you walk in the burn, for instance, uh, you, you know, does terrain matter to the floral communities that you see on the burn? Yes, of course it does. There's no flora on horizontal limestone uh, pavement, but in the gullies and crevices uh, between those pavement, slabs of pavement, there's a rich flora. So the same uh, question applies underwater here. And actually a lot of this terrain looks like the burn underwater, in fact, when you see the, uh, the bathymetry data. 
Um, so terrain matters in, in some respect, but we're not sure yet how it influences the structure and function of marine brinted communities. Also, it, it's more than simply terrain because, uh, you know, biological processes also influence communities. Grazers such as sea urchin uh, may dominate, uh, may, may influence really strongly the structure of brinted communities uh, and overwhelm any effect that terrain might have or may be detectable uh, due to, you know, in, in that respect. And also the overlying water column is important. So ocean oceanographic data, uh, shear bed current strength on top of the terrain data and accounting for biology is all important. And obviously it's a very uh, difficult problem to, um, to, tease, to tease apart. This is kind of typical crayfish, uh, crayfish habitat, in, uh, as I was saying, but it also might, might vary according to different life stages of the animal. So high rugosity may be very important in the early life history stages, which are cryptic and require very small hiding spaces uh, for uh, protection from predation, as opposed to uh, the terrain uh, later on when the animal is bigger. So we begin to explore these relationships between, in this case, uh, species richness and rugosity, for instance, at, uh, at, at the six sites. And you see, we, we do find some correlations, but they're quite weak, probably meaning that we have a sampling problem or that we're not looking at the key uh, terrain variable or that we're not describing the community appropriately in the, in the right way. But what are the key functional variables? Uh, we know we have a big multivariate problem here in trying to discern these, these, these relationships. Um, or are we simply looking at communities that are not that spatially structured in the first place? But in any case, there's an implication for monitoring. Uh, we have to design monitoring programs that we have confidence in. And we have to, we have therefore to explore uh, whether uh, these variables are important, which ones to use, and what are other ones uh, we, we need to consider. But even in, the, in these cases where we find low correlations, uh, we can at least begin to classify uh, using the terrain data, areas which are likely to support high diversity and low diversity. And this is a map uh, around the Iron Islands in Shmore showing areas of high and low species richness modeled using maximum likelihood classification based on the data we have. Uh, so immediately you would say that uh, there's a higher potential, there's a higher potential for high, high diversity on the west, uh, west side compared to the east side uh, of, of the islands. And that in itself is informative, even in the context of uh, future MPA design. Um, the second project we've just started, and it, it relates uh, closely to, I suppose, what Fabio was uh, talking about here uh, just, just a while ago, and we must talk to uh, to more about the that that program because we've um, we've also now ex extended the, the the project just in Kilkiran Bay into intertidal inter, inter, intertidal monitoring. So now we're using uh, drone imagery uh, of the intertidal zone in the same way that we use terrain data uh, from Inframar in the in the subtitle, and using various uh, classification uh, methods uh, to identify uh, the the main biological communities, seaweed cover, et cetera, on the intertidal zone as a, as a means of stratifying what we then do on the ground uh, by walking through these areas uh, to, to look at um, uh, biodiversity and structure and function of communities in, in more detail. And then when we go underwater, of course, we, we can't use that anymore. So we, we take the, then the, the bathymetry data, derive the terrain data, and use that to inform uh, informed biological sampling. So we now have, through Merck, uh, high capacity to have high precision georeferenced underwater video data that we can home in on very fine resolution, fine scale terrain uh, in order to explore those relationships uh, further. So in summary, our projects are evaluating these relationships between physical terrain uh, uh, derived from bathymetry and biological communities in reef, both in the intertidal and subtidal um, we have to identify metrics and indicators of change from that program. We don't know yet. We're still exploring those relationships, really. But whatever uh, comes out uh, at, at the end here, we need methods that are scalable to a national program. We do need a, a, a national scale program for monitoring of change and really input into other policy initiatives, such as uh, the expansion of the MPA uh, Marine Protected Area Network. 
And that monitoring program needs to be, we need to have confidence in it. Uh, it's not an ad hoc sampling program. It's not ad hoc allocation of sampling efforts. Uh, it needs to be stru structured based on the underlying, based on important underlying, uh, underlying uh, data on, on the physical, biological and, um, and oceanographic, um, oceanographic environment. Okay, thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Holly. Um, and just before you jump off uh, and, and I introduce the next speaker, the, uh, we're a little bit over time, about five minutes, but the, the next um, presentation is a little bit shorter than the previous one. So I was just going to give one question there that's come in from Rory Jackson. Uh, just wondering if the project is monitoring the massive loss in Sprat along our coasts. Um, not sure whether we have a loss of Sprat along our coasts, but um, no, this program wouldn't be uh, monitoring the, the status of pelagic. That, that would be done using fisheries acoustic, uh, fisheries acoustic survey. Thanks, Ali. We, we'll come back to you, Rory, offline on that if you want to pick up and clarify the question a little bit with us. Um, so thanks to all our speakers here, from to Ali, Fabio, Javi and, and, and Glenn. Um, there's two things before I introduce the next speaker that I just think are really clear um, and, and in this kind of move from baseline mapping to monitoring. And one of those is, is the, the level of, of research that's happening in the country in, in this space has, has evolved dramatically in, in the last few years compared to where we were um, when we started in from our, um, and, and this continued integration of multidisciplinary data and the use of technology has, has, has been kind of underpinning all this. And, and the second point is the value of the bathymetry, uh, even just as Ali presented there, to stratify the biological sampling, or as, as Javi talked to in the context of coastal uh, change monitoring, um, is critical. And, 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 and its, it's, its need to support the modeling is also really valuable. Um, so, OK, just to move on, our next and final speaker is David Parker from the UK HO. Uh, and uh, he's going to give an update on behalf of the Hydrographic Society of UK and Ireland uh, in terms of developments and plans and events forthcoming. Hello, I'm David Parker, Chief Executive of the Hydrographic Society UK and Ireland. Today I'm going to share with you some of our recent developments and plans and introduce you to our professional society. So just to give a quick overview, we'll run through that introduction. We'll talk about our remote hydrography conference and exhibition. We'll introduce you to the Hydrographic uh, Professional Accreditation Scheme and then encourage you to join our community. OK, so the Hydrographic Society UK and Ireland is an independent, non-profit learning. Our purpose is to raise awareness of the science of surveying at sea and protect and promote the status of the seabed mapping profession. Our individual and corporate members operate in many sectors, including surveying for nautical charting, Offshore resources, construction, engineering, oil and gas, renewable energy, environmental monitoring, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here are some of our strategic objectives. They include promote the science of surveying in both salt and freshwater environments, create a network for interaction of professionals involved in those disciplines, promote the dissemination of free exchange of information, promote the highest levels of accuracy and diligence promote the advancement of education and training, and offer support and guidance for those seeking continued professional development. So onto some news. News item number one is that the Hydrographic Society UK has just become this week, the Hydrographic Society UK and Ireland. This is our first step in uh, helping to bring the seabed mapping community within the island of Ireland even closer together. We hope this will help build the network and promote the profession and its opportunities. The island branch is led by Sean Cullen at the Geological Survey of Ireland. So please get involved. It's your professional community, so be a part of it. The next bit of news is that we're hosting the Remote Hydrography Conference and Exhibition next February. It'll run over three days at Dublin Castle, and it will include a live operations room with the ability to witness uh, the command and control of multiple uncrewed platforms. There'll also, of course, be three days of technical papers from across the industry. The exhibition has already sold out, but there are still further sponsorship opportunities available if your company is interested. And delegate registration for the conference will open next week. So now I'd like to discuss the Hydrographic Professional Accreditation Scheme. This was actually developed by UK and Ireland, but rolled out on an international basis by the International Federation of Hydrographic Societies. 
HPAS is designed to assist and support individual qualified and experienced hydrographic professionals in demonstrating their competency, capability and development of their careers. It's designed to evaluate and assess applicants against the IBSC S5 standards with pathways and competency levels developed to reflect knowledge and experience while demanding high standards of ethics and conduct. In addition, HPAS will support reciprocal mutual recognition agreements in the future with other individual schemes, such as the Australasian and Canadian schemes. So why do we need HPAS? Well, as we know, hydrography and seabed mapping in general is a complex and critical activity. It is therefore critical that professionals are suitably educated, trained and have appropriate experience. HPAS is designed to recognise and categorise such individuals rather than only the courses they potentially took years or decades ago. This will ensure appropriate personnel are engaged and will protect and promote appropriate professional standards. Also, accreditation is on the increase within hydrography. There's been a marked growth in accreditation scheme recently, including schemes in France, Germany, Canada, Australia, US, etc. But these schemes are not multinational. And we're concerned that these national schemes only encourage local protectionism, which doesn't suit our truly international profession. People do not want to be accredited or certified in multiple jurisdictions. Um, they want to do this once and have it recognised worldwide if possible. Accreditation is the norm in uh, many equivalent industries, such as engineering. So, um, you know, we're not doing anything new. This is a, this is a common requirement across uh, similar professions. And for the UK and Ireland, there will soon be very limited opportunities to undertake the core category A recognised education. So what are the key aims for HPAS? Well, we intend for HPAS to recognise the education, experience, skills and ongoing development of professionals engaged in hydrography. We hope to extend the international significance and coverage of individual um, professional accreditation schemes by seeking that mutual recognition with other parallel schemes. In doing so, we will raise the profile of the uh, seabed mapping profession and encourage the highest levels of professionalism within the hydrographic community. HPAS is designed to evaluate and assess individual applicants against the IBSC S5 standards with pathways and competency levels uh, developed to reflect uh, individual knowledge and experience. And to ensure the best alignment with existing and recognised uh, international infrastructure, we have sought recognition of the scheme from the International Board of Standards and Competence um, at the IHO. And uh, we were submitting to them at the end of this year and should have an outcome early in the spring. Thanks very much, David. Uh, it was a really interesting talk on the the developments in the Hydrographic Society of the UK and now Ireland. And it's great that the, the title has been expanded to include Ireland because there is that really important relationship between Ireland and the UK in that Inframar data is still supplied to the UK Hydrographic Office to update our, our navigational charts. And it's a good reminder as well that as we move into more uh, mapping and monitoring as we go on, that the, the data are collected to very stringent um, international hydrographic standards. Um, and this benefits the scientific community in turn, as well as the hydrographers, because you're, you're getting the data at its, at its best, at its most accurate and high quality. Um, and it is necessary to keep doing it that way because we, we are continuing to find unmapped shoals and hazards every year, especially obviously in inshore waters. And we release um, navigational warnings on a regular basis. Um, in addition, I'd like to thank all the speakers. It was a really nice range of talks, very interesting, really cutting edge stuff and on topical of all the challenges facing, well, humans in terms of coastal erosion. These are referenced as well. You know, the, the, the mapping and monitoring is covering a range of sectors in that, in that respect. Um, I think all the questions were answered in real time. Um, if anybody has any other questions, Remember, you can email us at infomar, uh, sorry, info at infomar.ie. And uh, thanks very much for attending the webinar. I'll hand back over to Tommy now. Thanks, Owen. Uh, and just uh, a couple of short comments before we close. Uh, we do hope that the lack of live questions and answers during the webinar didn't, didn't sort of take from the, the, uh, the update. Um, we did want to give a short, concise digital 
program update today. So we chose to take this kind of approach to doing it. And um, just, to, you know, we're very conscious of how much time everybody's spending on Zoom and, and Teams. Um, with that, um, we look forward to seeing everybody in person in February next year uh, and the dates for your calendar again. The Infomar conference or seminar is November 16th. Uh, sorry, um, the day before the, uh, the International Infomar um, event uh, that was just mentioned. Uh, we'll post the, the, the dates on the website. Um, in terms of the, um, the one observation I'd make is the value of, of, of the joint program, which reaches all kind of conventions in terms of how you approach uh, management of, of an initiative of this scale, but it's, it's clear the benefits have been really valuable in that the diverse areas of interest of both the, the Marine Institute and the Geological Survey come to the fore in terms of the, the breadth of, 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 of knowledge and, and uh, stakeholder use of the data. Um, so that's been really valuable and, and clear from today's um, ex sort of wide range of presentations. Um, the poll is now closed. Uh, so just before we let everybody go, I'm hoping that somebody can flash up the poll results and we'll see where we got to. So the three questions, uh, I think everybody sees this. Um, the first one was creating a seamless map. Second one was a resurvey program, the development thereof. And the third one was kind of increased engagement with, with the existing uh, products we have. So it's interesting to see that there, there is support for all three areas with particular interest in a resurvey program. Um, I guess the, the key driver for that is because people are aware as we come to the end of Infomar that there's, there's a lot of areas with dynamic seabed sensitive habitats. Um, and so we have, you know, not just our, our special areas of conservation we have to monitor and manage, we also have other areas in our coastal shelf and offshore. Uh, that we need to look towards. Um, yeah, so there's other, other data sets we, we'll also have to look to, to building into the future um, operational activities, be it CPT for offshore renewable energy or Sparker data to, to look at, at depth to bedrock. But we, we, we'll, we'll factor all this into our as a assessment over the coming year to contribute to the 2023 program review we mentioned. Um, but with that, on behalf of uh, everybody uh, on the Infomar team, I'd like to thank you all for attending today and, uh, and we'll close the event at this point. Thanks all. Thank you.